Welcome to FDU EdCast, a podcast about teaching, learning, and educational justice. My name is Brian Mooney, and I'm an assistant professor of education in the San Martino School of Education at Barely Dickinson University. As your host, I'll be facilitating conversations with all kinds of people, including teacher educators, scholars, authors, alumni, community members, and young people. Together, we'll explore the intersections of teaching, learning, social justice, and so much more. Let's jump into the conversation. Okay, so welcome back to another episode of FDU EdCast. We are super excited to be joined by FDU lecturer, professor, historian, sociologist extraordinaire, Dr. Randall Westbrook. So if you could all just help me uh, welcome him to the episode, that'd be fantastic. Uh, And for those of you who might not be familiar with Dr. Westbrook's uh, work and his research and his teaching, just a quick uh, little bit about him and his work. Uh, Dr. Randall Westbrook is a lecturer in the School of Education here at Fairleigh Dickinson University. He's an expert on W.E.B. Du Bois. Dr. Westbrook's work has appeared in numerous academic journals and college textbooks, such as the Journal for African American History. He earned his bachelor's degree from Livingstone College in Salisbury, North Carolina, where he he received recognition from President Ronald Reagan, the Reverend Jesse Jackson, and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. He earned his master's and doctoral degrees right here in New Jersey from Rutgers University. And his doctoral study on Du Bois focused on Du Bois' contributions to educational thought prior to 1905. Dr. Westbrook has a wealth of knowledge, history, and experience that informs his advocacy work on racial and social justice, his work as a contributor to the Journal of Negro Education, and his article for the Harvard Law School Journal on Racial and Ethnic Justice, and as an educator, has always been pursued to advance excellence and equity in education. So, We're super excited to have you join us here today in the studio here on our Metro campus to talk about all things W.E.B. Du Bois, uh, education, liberation, et cetera. Um, Do you want to say a quick hello and sort of just give us a little bit of a synopsis about the history of your work and teaching and research? Okay. Thank you, Brian, and and hello. Um, My interest in W.E.B. Du Bois actually began... um, in my early years in college, um, Du Bois actually called Livingstone a kind of black Harvard um, mm. because he felt that they exemplified the new direction that African Americans wanted to take mm. uh, post emancipation, in that they, pro- they offered programs that were both um, academic program, they had an academic program, but they used that in addition to, instead of uh, mm. an alternative one or the other. Um, they also had an industrial program. So they were the one of the only universities, uh, colleges and universities in the country that had a dual track and insisted that students do both. Mm. Interesting, very interesting. And so speaking of that sort of vocational part, right? Yes. Um, it recalls, you know, conversations we've had about the differences in educational thought and philosophy between Booker T. Washington and Du Bois, right? And so when I think about that, I wondered if you could speak to what what would Du Bois make of of the shift away from formal post secondary education towards you know um, more vocational uh, uh, focus in education because I know that was one of the major divisions between how they thought about education you know Booker T Washington having this more vocational industrial focus, Du Bois' insistence on the intellectual, the humanities, the liberal arts education, and education as an enlightenment project. So I wondered if you could speak to that that, uh, division, how you see it play out today. Well, you you know, one of the things that's important to to understand is that uh, Du Bois did see a need and an importance um, in the importance in industrial education. But he also wanted, within that, Mm -hmm. he wanted people to pursue broad education. So he would call it broad knowledge, right? And broad mm-hmm. sympathy, which is empathy. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he's one of the, the first educators um, in, in the late 19th, early 20th century to actually talk about empathy mm-hmm. as as a byproduct of education. And he thought that, that that helped the farmer as well as the scholar. Mm-hmm. So, so Du Bois' approach to education really dealt with um, the broadest application of knowledge. Um, and in mm-hmm. fact, um, in his earliest writings, he talked about how important it was, no matter what your, well, no matter what your vocation, your occupation, mm-hmm. um, that you should learn to read. Mm-hmm. Um, and he actually talked about literacy and education 
Um, and he used a phrase we almost need it as self-defense, which kind mm. of reminds me of what um, Malcolm said mm. you know, literally 80 years, 80 years later. Wow. Du Bois talked about this in 1885 mm. when he was a teenager. Yeah. And then 80 years later, you hear Malcolm talking about it when he's talking about the ballad or the bullet. So you see that there's a through line mm -hmm. relative to what is the purpose of education for that. But as it relates to vocation, mm -hmm. and this is the demarcation between uh, Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois, mm -hmm. that you saw that, that Washington really focused on industrial education mm -hmm. primarily because his benefactors insisted that he do so. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so when you look at the faculty at Tuskegee, half the faculty at Tuskegee have been trained at Oberlin, Harvard, um, and, you know, at various uh, high um, mm. so-called so higher learning institutions mm -hmm. um, of the day. Um, Fisk University, which was considered competitive with most of the other non-Ivy schools. Mm -hmm. um, but he had them working with rudimentary education and actually frowned on too far advanced mm -hmm. um, curriculum. Mm -hmm. um, du Bois thought that that was a bad idea. He said, we should learn as much as we can, irrespective, because um, the, higher you, the, 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 the higher you're learning, mm -hmm. the more you think about a broader set of things, the more you think about a broader set of things, the more you can figure out ways to apply your knowledge, and it feeds dreams. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, we see that, that contemporary educational philosophy mm -hmm. actually talks about the value of aspiration. And this is something that Du Bois was actually dealing with yeah. long before it became vogue. Yeah, it, so. it sounds like he's way ahead of his time in a number of areas related specifically to education. I'm thinking even in particular with literacy, mm -hmm. right? You know, a recent scholar who's been uh, writing about um 19th century black literary societies, Dr. Goldie Muhammad, mm -hmm. she, in her study of those groups, found that literacy, their pursuit of literacy was directly connected to liberation. Yes. And, and identity mm -hmm. um, and intellect and joy. And so I wondered if you could speak to that in terms of W.B. Du Bois. Maybe those of us who you know are teachers of writing, English teachers, people concerned with the literacy development of young people, mm -hmm. that it is not only just a cognitive process, but it is actually deeply connected to struggles for liberation, social justice, et cetera. When you read, when you read Du Bois' writings, and one mm -hmm. of the things that, that fascinated me and the reason that I decided to pursue mm -hmm. Du Bois' work um, basically, you know, before he turned 40, yeah. you know, was, was how remarkable his, his work was. And, and I don't call it visionary because sometimes mm -hmm. visionary has sort of a pejorative mm -hmm. um, connotation. But you know, talking about set, uh, talking about debates and literary societies mm -hmm. in his earliest writings, he started writing for newspapers for public consumption when he was 15 years old, right after his 15th birthday. Right, and you're reading these articles without knowing that it's Du Bois, and he's saying, "I think it would be a good idea mm -hmm. if the Negro men of our town would." would learn to read mm -hmm. and there'll be a debate at the local AME Zion church mm -hmm. um, and there'll be a reading society and there'll be a quilting. So he saw that there was a social fabric that could be mm -hmm. knitted from, from these literary pursuits. Mm -hmm. um, but he also talked about it and, and one of the early things that he talks about um, and he mentions it in Souls of Black Folk um, mm -hmm. when he talks about how the walls of prisons for the black man are straight and high mm -hmm. and he talks about that as you know reading and knowledge the pursuit of knowledge as a spiritual journey mm -hmm. as well as an intellectual journey wow um and again with we're, we're going back more than 100 years that's why mm -hmm. and, and i want to i'm going to make another contemporary connection because mm -hmm. that's incredible that he was even using that terminology because people who we cite now in education, like Bettina Love, talked about how schools are often spirit murdering children of color in many ways. Yes. And so that also raises the idea of our educational pursuits and journey and identities as spiritual in nature. And because he was concerned with the souls of, yes. of, of young folks in Liter particular. Right? Literally. And I mean, that, that's part of the reason that he, you know, he says this in the forethought in The mm. Souls of Black Folk. He talks about he talks about the pursuit of 
a better life, which can be gained through education, mm. okay, as as a spiritual journey. Yeah. This then, he said, mm -hmm. is the journey of the souls of black folk. Mm. So he was always connected um, with with that with with that connection. He mm -hmm. was always with that link, and and that was central to central to his purpose. Mm. And he was always trying to get African Americans to engage in these aspirational literary journeys mm. you know, teaching um, Cicero mm -hmm. you know recitations of Cicero's um, defense of Archaeus the poet mm. and and he would teach it to them in Greek and in Hebrew mm -hmm. and in English and then he as he said when he talked about it at 18 years old he taught it for the first time mm -hmm. with contemporary applications. Mm. This was his phrase that he used in 1897. Okay, this is yeah. a 19 year old Du Bois reporting yeah. back to his class to his classmates at Fisk that this is what he did in the summer in the backwoods of Tennessee in a town that didn't have uh, schooling for black students. Mm -hmm. Only had it once since emancipation and here he is 20 years later mm -hmm. and he's teaching them Cicero. Right. And he's teaching and again. And Plato and, and Socrates. Plato and Socrates uh -huh. in Greek, in Hebrew, right. and in English. And it's so incredible to me because I, I wasn't sure if we'd go here, but I think we should because that idea of him seeing the larger pursuits of education as an enlightenment project definitely does contrast starkly with a view of education that is purely focused on preparing young people for careers and to enter the workforce and to participate in capitalism, right? It's not to say one or the other, right? I've heard people frame it as learning to earn versus learning for freedom or liberation. But it sounds like you're saying also he wasn't opposed to preparing young people, especially the black community, to be able to be self-sufficient and work and enter careers. But he saw through to the more fundamental nature of what it means to learn. Right. Well, not only that, I mean, you, you know, not all men can go to college, but some men must, is mm -hmm. what he said, mm -hmm. okay? And, and he talked about, you know, in, in uh, his writings from, from the two summers that he taught in Tennessee, mm -hmm. there was a, a young man named Fat Rubin, mm -hmm. who was one of the younger boys in the school who said, when I grow up, I want to own my farm. Mm. And he paid particular attention to Reuben because when he came back 10 years later, Reuben had been married mm. and had a farm. Wow. Okay. And, and Du Bois always believed this. It, and it wasn't a one or the other. Mm. It was actually both. Mm. And that's what made him so unique. You know, in, yeah. in the contemporary you know we're we're so over specialized and he was very concerned about that and he mm -hmm. was he was over overly concerned about it or perhaps appropriately concerned mm -hmm. irrespective of are you going to be an academic or are you going to be an agrarian or are you going to be a laborer mm -hmm. don't specialize right learn as much as you be can be well rounded yeah. right be well rounded learn mm -hmm. as much as you can so that you can take this and you have this perspective so he yeah. knew about these things yeah. it's it's an early argument in and uh, and advocacy for a liberal arts education yes. studying philosophy studying the arts yes. you know being immersed and you know particular and and he was an avid fiction writer as well yes. right so yes. i wanted to get your thoughts on uh the chapter of the coming of john from the souls of of black folk mm -hmm. and you know, there's a piece out there that we'll link to for our listeners that that connects that chapter in particular to ideas that Paulo Freire wrote about later in Pedagogy of the Oppressed, particularly his idea of critical consciousness. Yes. But also, I think you see a strand of that in Maxine Green's uh, notion of wide awakeness. Yes. And he and that article we'll link to also connects back to Plato's turning around of the soul. So I wonder if you could thread those together for That's us. Right. I think that'd be really interesting. Sure. Well, I mean, Freire refers to Du Bois, Maxine Green refers to Du Bois, That's Du Bois right. referred to Plato, mm -hmm. right? Um, of the Coming of John is one of my uh, favorite pieces in, in the Du Bois canon. Mm -hmm. um, it's semi-biographical, and most people didn't realize that because yeah. it came out of his papers, yeah. that you know he talks about how education transforms us, and he talks about John being sort of this rough hue, mm -hmm. uh, black John, that is mm -hmm. to say. Uh, because there are two, mm -hmm. Black John being this rough-hewn man who 
seemed to have a very good nature about him, but was was so unschooled and and just unsophisticated. Mm. And he starts learning about the possibilities of education. Mm -hmm. And at one point, when the lessons finally start to occur to him, Mm -hmm. he talks about a physical transformation that his suit, his clothes fit better. Wow. He changes his walk. Mm -hmm. He changes his his attitude. Mm -hmm. But he talks about a a certain kind of of anger. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's the consciousness. Mm -hmm. His realization that the world around him Mm -hmm. had some cruel elements to it. And so it was that when John finally graduated from from his school, Mm -hmm. and he goes back home, he realizes that that his transformation Mm -hmm. was uncomfortable, not just to the white citizens who said that he had been ruined, Mm -hmm. but also to the black citizens. Mm -hmm. And when you look, okay, the the letter that he he announced to his mother that he was coming home because he'd finished his education Mm -hmm. was a, he directly uh, quoted from his own diary entry Mm -hmm. when he was 25 years old and he was a year and a half away from finishing a doctorate at the most prestigious university in the world, wow. which was the University of Berlin. Hmm. Okay. Now, fast forward a year and a half later, when he didn't get the money to complete his degree at the University of Berlin, mm-hmm. he settled on his fallback school mm-hmm. and completed his doctorate at Harvard. Right. And when we stop to think about that, okay, what was your fallback school <laughs> if, if your education didn't work out as you planned I'll just go back and write a dissertation at Harvard. (laughs) Right. He had already written a dissertation at the University of Berlin, but he ran out of money. Mm -hmm. So when he's talking about John, John's coming home. Mammy, I'm coming home. Mm -hmm. And he comes home and he comes to become a teacher. Mm -hmm. And he starts teaching liberation. Mm -hmm. And when he's teaching liberation, the town father finds out about it. The Mm -hmm. town father um, was a judge. Mm -hmm. Okay. And there's an interesting autobiographical aspect of that. Mm -hmm. The judge who tried to get the boys thrown into reform school when Mm -hmm. he was 12 years old for pilfering grapes out of the backyard with a bunch of other boys, Mm -hmm. um, he was talked out of that and rescued by the the high school principal. Mm -hmm. So, So white John who is the son of this town's father Mm -hmm. had been educated at Princeton. Mm -hmm. Okay. Known as the then mm-hmm. as the northernmost bastion of Southern male aristocracy, mm. and White John and Black John grew up together, mm-hmm. but then they diverged because yeah. life paths in in um, post um, emancipation South. Sure. Black John goes back and he starts to teach. He's teaching liberation. They find out about it. They shut the school. Mm. And when John walks away after he is dismissed as the teacher for the colored children, Mm -hmm. his sister runs up to him and she asks him this question. It's existential and it's central to to Du Bois' development. Mm. She said, John, does it make everyone unhappy when they learn new things? And it was at that moment that, Mm. that... that John realized that his transformation was complete. Hmm. He might have appeared to be angry. You know, we have this thing called the angry black man, and Mm. and it's, you know, it's it's sort of like the connotation of of a contemplative African-American, and and, and he's not doing the requisite smiling to get along, Mm. to, to go along to get along. Sure. John smiles, and he says to his sister, I'm afraid it does. And she thinks about it for a few moments, and she says, well, then I think that I'm angry, too. And she gives him a kiss, and she runs off into the woods. Hmm. And the story ends a few pages later Hmm. with him ending up having to defend his sister who has been assaulted. Mm -hmm. But it's that realization, it's that consciousness that Du Bois made. And and the autobiographical part about that Mm -hmm. was his transformation at 18 and 19 years old when he was in the backwoods of Tennessee, he mm-hmm. realized the significance yeah. that no matter how, that most of the people that he taught were probably never going to make it to college, mm-hmm. but they were able to make it in terms of their dreams and their aspirations because, yeah. of, the, because of the knowledge that they gained in his classroom, talking about Cicero and Plato and yeah. Aristotle. 
it's, it's kind of gut wrenching, but also beautiful. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and to think about what happens to us yes. when we become aware of reality, yes. of overlapping systems of injustice, of these things that affect people deeply, intimately. It can be a very painful yes. awakening or awareness, right? I also like how he writes, though, about hope and yes. also our, and as Freire puts it, our human agency and our capacity to intervene and perhaps even responsibility to intervene in the world in disrupting injustice. Yes. And I think from that process, right, if it only stopped at the awareness part, that might be a very hard place to dwell in for a long time, right? And I think as educators, we are, you know, concerned with hope maybe more than most. Well, well and that's yeah. and that's part of the reason why, yeah. you know, the, despite, um, mm -hmm. you know, the, the the characterizations of Du Bois mm -hmm. um, with the with the simmering um, that there is no simmering resentment. Mm -hmm. He is an optimist. Mm -hmm. You can't be, you can't not be an optimist. Yeah and talk about hope the way he did. Yeah, I'd yeah. say you, you can't be a teacher and not be uh, invested in, uh, in hope and a future that it looks is, better than today. It is about the striving. Mm -hmm. And that's what Du Bois always talked about. He, he, mm -hmm. he was consumed with climbing to mm -hmm. whatever level. And, and you know one of the things that we see today mm -hmm. as, we, you know, as we talk about what is the most appropriate type of learning mm -hmm. Part of the reason why he always wanted there to be some type of intellectual pursuit inside mm -hmm. of learning was because he felt that whatever we did, it yeah. required aspiration. Mm -hmm. And your aspirations are always going to be higher than your mm -hmm. present circumstance. Yeah. But the better informed your aspirations are, mm -hmm. the better your aspirations. Mm -hmm. And knowing that you have something to strive for, mm -hmm. and and that's what he concerned himself with, and yeah. that's why and that's why he believed that it was important mm -hmm. for the farmer mm -hmm. to get the type of education, learn as much as he could, mm -hmm. that the lawyer should learn as much as he could, mm -hmm. that the doctor could learn as much as he could. Mm -hmm. You know, we talk about bedside manner and the death of bedside manner now. Mm -hmm. Well, part of that is because of over-specialization. Yeah, okay? that's a good point. You know, so we, when we start talking about this, right, mm -hmm. we're not talking about a student walking into college mm -hmm. and deciding that they want to be a doctor Mm. before they've taken a biology class. Not even college. We're talking well, about middle school and high school now <laughs> yes. with the emphasis on career and technical education, exactly. vocational studies. And, and I've seen schools doing great work in those areas. But it's also problematic to think that young people will be able to choose, and not only will be able to, should choose a career path that young and what do they miss out on in terms of that well-rounded liberal arts education or being able to change their mind later? Well, they, they miss out on the possibilities mm -hmm. of and they miss out on aspirations. They literally mm -hmm. cut they cut their dreams short mm -hmm. by over specializing too early. And that's the one thing that we don't know. What, what do you want to learn? Yeah. The answer should be everything. But it's so tied to the demands of a capitalism, right? And a kind of hyper capitalism of, you know, entering the workforce, uh, you know, being able to produce in this global economy, right? And and I, I worry sometimes that we lose sight of those larger, more noble pursuits of right. what education can offer us in well, terms of our full humanity. We, in, in, our, in our quest mm -hmm. to leave no child behind, mm -hmm. we're leaving dreams on the table. Yeah. Okay. We're leaving the dreams behind, mm -hmm. and we should not be over specializing. Mm -hmm. And Du Bois was talking about this mm -hmm. 140 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he was talking about this 140 years ago, and we're still arguing about it today. Yeah. He was talking about liberatory, liberatory, uh, liberatory um, pedagogy, pe pedagogy yeah. Yeah. back when he was 17 years old. Yeah, and you know on the 60th anniversary of his death, mm -hmm. we're still talking about it. Okay, so we're talking about 155 years mm -hmm. after he first started talking about it, and here we are still engaged in this debate. Same conversation, so, so yeah. Be, different rhetoric, same, yeah. same di conversation. Different rhetoric, same same. But discussion. that aspirational part is so important, right? Because um, 
we can see that as an asset and as a, as a form of uh, 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 wealth and capital. I, uh, there's a scholar, Tari Yasso, who writes about community cultural wealth, and she points out these different kinds of wealth or assets that exist, particularly in communities of color, that mm -hmm. sometimes educators and schools don't see. Right. Um, you know, and so she cites one of them as aspirational capital, right? The, the the dreams, the hopes, the desires that young people embody and walk into our schools with that sometimes we ignore or are rendered invisible, you know? So mm -hmm. I love thinking about dreams. And, you know, people like Gloria Letts and Billings have written about, you know, teachers as dream keepers. You know, what does it mean to preserve those those yes. hopes and dreams, some of which are not even articulated yet? In the but, of young but but a true te you know in the in the true spirit of being a teacher we very often see that that the teachers recognize those in the children yeah you know the great teachers recognize them in the children you know I, I tell a story to my class about my one of my teachers all the way in the first grade mm -hmm. who who told me to be careful about the about the types of jokes that I told and self deprecating humor hmm. and she said you don't want to get too much into that. Because if you get to a point where people, you can't always depend on people to understand that the humor is mm. not about you, but it is about the circumstance. And if they forget mm. that, they'll compromise your dream. Now, she didn't say it in those exact terms, mm. but she made it very clear to me that I needed to adjust the manner in which I carried myself as a person who had a particular joy mm. for living, mm -hmm. you know, and, and wow. so, so she was already telling me, mm. you know, don't let your sense of humor, don't let your humor, period, mm -hmm. be an agent in interrupting your dream, in, in forestalling, you know, your, your That's aspiration. Pow That's powerful. And you know, connecting this thread of aspiration, it sounds like, you know, Du Bois was very much concerned with the individual aspirations um, of black men and, 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 you know, black women, black children, black communities. So I wanted to get to that community part, like yes. his aspirations for the masses to rise up. Mm -hmm. And we can certainly talk about the Talented Tenth and what his beliefs were about, you know, that Talented Tenth and their role in bringing up the masses. But also a, a key feature of his educational thought and philosophy was this idea of communal uplift, right? So I wanted to ask you, you know, how did he see education as fundamentally connected to community uplift? He has this term uh, colleges being in and of their communities. So I wanted you to just be able to speak to that. Well, um, that discussion of colleges being in and of mm -hmm. was was a part of the central ethos of the historically black college. Mm -hmm. You know, even to this day, we still see that. Yeah. Okay, you were sent here mm -hmm. was the message that he got when he arrived at Fisk mm -hmm. in in eighteen eighty six. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, you were sent here. Mm -hmm. You didn't just come here you didn't just decide to be here mm. you were divinely sent wow and you were sent here you know as as they you know in, in some churches we'll see on the um somewhere prominently displayed enter to worship depart to serve mm. so in other words you come in mm -hmm. and you worship at and he, he used this visualization as well mm. that you're that you're kneeling at the altar of knowledge. Wow. And when you rise, you're going out to serve your community. Mm -hmm. And he felt that. He talked about it in his circular letters when he was mm -hmm. in college. Mm -hmm. He talked about it when he was a student at Fisk. Mm -hmm. um, it's one of the first lessons that he learned was, was that whole community uplift. Yeah. And he always believed in it. What is the, 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 the job of the Talented Tenth? Mm -hmm. And one of his greatest heartbreaks is what, what I talk about. Mm -hmm. He talks about in, in, uh, in 1948, 45 years after the um, essay was first written, mm -hmm. um, he almost suggests that if he had been aware of, of people misinterpreting what the Talented Tenth was, mm -hmm. he might have written it differently. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, you hear... The, the, the Negro race, like all races, mm -hmm. is to be led by its exceptional men. Mm -hmm. And by the way, mm -hmm. very important point, he made a point as a college student mm -hmm. and several times beyond mm 
He said, it's not just men. Mm -hmm. It's the mothers and daughters of men. Right. Because I could see yeah, that you could, you know, read it through a feminist lens and yes. critique it for sure. And well, I'm sure. And, that, and he was and he yeah. was an early feminist. I mean, mm -hmm. You know, he's, you can't look at any major thing that he ever did mm -hmm. that he didn't have a woman prominently involved mm -hmm. in the development of it. Even the fiction that he well, wrote. Right. Or well, the semi autobiographical. All, all fiction. of his yeah. all of his fiction had. A, a woman protagonist either mm -hmm. as the mm -hmm. <laughs> protagonist or as the the next character yeah. um, you know again in the coming of John the person who made him realize mm -hmm. you know his his purpose yeah was his 16 year old sister so mm -hmm. and that and everything that he wrote yeah. including the seven books that he's never published yeah they all meant there is always a woman who mm -hmm. is right at the center yeah. Who 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 decide who helps him to determine and understand yeah. and discover his purpose? Yeah. But the community thing mm -hmm. again. What is the purpose of the talented tenth? Is the lead mm -hmm. okay? But he uses the he uses the phrase that talks about education as guiding or education as leading. He mm -hmm. uses that in the early 1900s, mm -hmm. and he said that is our purpose. Mm -hmm. Our purpose is once we learn more things, mm -hmm. our job is to lead others to that place, mm -hmm. guide them to that place, mm -hmm. not stand so far out in front mm -hmm. that 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 we become unattainable. Yeah, it, and and he tried to emphasize that, but mm -hmm. a lot of people. Miss Interpret. I, I will, in mm -hmm. all candor, mm -hmm. um, when I first read The Talented Tenth, it took me several readings before I understood mm -hmm. the nuance and the significance. I mean, I, I, I embraced leadership, mm -hmm. but I didn't embrace leadership at what I would call an elemental, spiritual level mm -hmm. for, for several years not in the way that Du Bois articulated um, it. It is spiritual. It's it's like you know, like the old saying, "Each one teach one." Yes. Um, but also, it's it's deeper than that, right? Um, because I I wonder also about this idea of the talented tenth, and I guess it's been read and misinterpreted as being elitist and whatnot. Yes. And and he himself and some of his ideas were. So I'd love for you to you know push back on that. But also, what might the implications be for us thinking about public education today, particularly programs like gifted and talented education, where we know there are stark racial disparities? Well, I mean, you know, Du Bois understood, well, first of all, relative to the elite versus the elitist. Mm -hmm. um, I view it in racialized language. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm, I'm always I'm always troubled when when um, African Americans or other racialized groups mm -hmm. are being told that they're moving too fast mm -hmm. and that they're trying to get out ahead. No one ever disparages the Marines. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> True. <laughs> for 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 the for the for the Green Berets, right? Right. They, no no one ever, you know the whenever you're trying to develop an elite force, mm -hmm. you're developing elite force mm -hmm. to be a leader. But it's also supposed to be a model of aspiration. Yeah. But when we start talking about black excellence, mm -hmm. you know, what you, want to, what you want to start talking about is, are you getting too far ahead of the masses? Mm. Well, no. Your concern should be, mm -hmm. am I providing a platform by which the masses can catch up with the leader? Mm. And I would say that the answer is almost usually no, because what happens is, African-American aspiration at some point becomes too dangerous. Okay. I was going to say, are, are you going too fast to make the white people uncomfortable? <laughs> right. Essentially is what it is, right? Are, are you making them uncomfortable? Yeah. And, and, you know, I, I, I'm reminded of a, of a time when I went to a, a conference mm -hmm. and, and Harold Washington, who was the first black mayor of Chicago, mm -hmm. was talking and somebody said to him, Hey man, why are you using all these fancy words? Why don't you come down here and talk so that you can speak at the level of the people? Mm -hmm. And he said, and his response was, "Why don't you learn these words? Because when you learn these words, mm -hmm. the younger people behind you are going to want to learn those words. Mm -hmm. And if enough of us learn those words, mm -hmm. we're going to scare some folks mm -hmm. who have 
who believe that they have no reason to fear us mm. and and they don't fear us so they don't respect us mm -hmm. and they don't respect us so they don't accommodate us and they don't accommodate us so they don't recognize us mm -hmm. so build up your vocabulary just like you build up your word capital just like you build up your financial capital mm -hmm. and 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 linguistic that, capital yeah, yeah that's and, another from Tariaso's yeah, model actually okay. she says that's another form of capital that i think a lot of schools and teachers and administrators don't see right the linguistic assets actually and it could be vocabulary certainly but it could also just be the ways that young people invent language and remix it and put it into conversation with other ideas to me it's inspiring and it's 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 cool to hear you say that he was thinking about yeah. these forms of of capital and, and these assets and, and he talked about it he yeah. he would go to programs and he mm -hmm. would do um you know one of his favorite things is he would have he would have table readings of, mm -hmm. of um, Aristophanes and, and, mm -hmm. and all this kind of stuff. I mean, yeah. you know, they would ask him what types of things should, should black people read, and he mm -hmm. would come back with a 30-page bibliography. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, you know, and, 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 you know, okay, 130 years ago, mm -hmm. when we demonized black people for learning how to read, right? okay, it's no different, okay? We're demonizing people because you're reading too much stuff. I, I remember mm -hmm. reading uh, in in a uh, black periodical mm -hmm. um, a criticism about David Levering Lewis's book, mm -hmm. uh, his, his Pulitzer Prize winning books about Du Bois, mm -hmm. that his language was too sophisticated. Hmm. What uh, an insultingly ridiculous mm -hmm. concept to be written by a black journalist. Mm -hmm. In other words, you're using words that people don't understand mm -hmm. and you're going to scare them away. Well, did it ever dawn on you that if you use those words and they're intrigued with the story that also happens to have the words, that you'll look those words mm -hmm. up? Mm -hmm. You know, the, the most exciting part that most people remember about Malcolm X mm -hmm. is that he read the dictionary. Now, there's <laughs> some questions as to whether or not he actually did it. Yeah. But people remember that. Yeah. As a means of power, mm -hmm. he developed his power through words. Right. That's that literacy right. part is being connected to empowerment, mm -hmm. not just for self, but for our community. Correct. That's really powerful. Mm -hmm. And um, I wanted to, 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 you know, first of all, it's reminded me of Toni Morrison, who used to tell her graduate students, uh, you know, your job when you leave here, when you go get your fancy jobs after Princeton or wherever they were, you know, is not to just sort of cop and go or, you know, just take it and leave like grab bag candy. She said, your job is then to empower someone else. Right. And so I think about that often um, with this idea of, of uplift that has kind of threaded itself throughout. Our conversation. I, I wanted a, us to talk about the idea of double consciousness. That's probably the one most people are familiar with when they hear Du Bois. I know in my education preparation courses, we probably touched on it or read it a little. I wish I had opportunity to delve in more. I know you believe as a scholar of Du Bois that that sort of is a thread that runs throughout all his work and all his life. So I wondered if you could speak to that. How does it thread through? And what might he say about young people today and how they're experiencing double consciousness in the various social institutions that they're participating, including schools. Well, he begins he begins that um, that whole interrogatory with between me and the world is an unasked question. How does it feel to be a problem? That must be where ta -Nehisi Coates gets his yeah. between me and the, the mm -hmm. world. Yeah. And 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 that is that is basically the first line of the main body mm -hmm. of the souls of black folk, mm -hmm. right? One ever feels is twoness. Mm -hmm. One black, okay, mm -hmm. with these two warring souls who's who 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 are being held together, not who, not being torn asunder, whose indomitable strength is what able to keep them together. It's a strange thing, he said. He continues to be a problem, mm -hmm. especially for one who has never been anything but. And so this double consciousness is mm -hmm. how do I keep myself and how do I live this life mm -hmm. knowing that the problem that I am mm -hmm. is about the person that I am trying to become. Mm -hmm. So at the same time, I'm, I am who I am. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I'm trying to become someone else, not someone better. Mm -hmm. 
someone else, mm-hmm. right? And, and, and so you've got this whole discussion of, of double consciousness. Mm-hmm. One always sees himself through the eyes of those who see him, mm-hmm. right? So we know. So it's a white, the white gaze, essentially, the, the, right? It's a white gaze. Which Morrison wrote about um, in Playing in the Dark. We'll right. link to it for people. I also think about, in my work, the hip-hop ways of knowing and being that young, pe- young people of color have today and right. how that also is a form of double consciousness that uh, many of them who participated in my dissertation research and that I worked with in K-12 through schools talked about that feeling of having to leave parts of themselves at the door yes. of the classroom and walk into the institution. Um, and, and so I wonder, and, I, and I, I encourage teachers to think about the ways that young people in their classroom might be dealing with dueling identities that are being imposed upon them. Well, yeah, they, and I mean, they, you know, the ability to be able to, um, to navigate that. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I was just listening um, to, to, to Fred, um, to, to Frederick's um, discussion of his book, mm-hmm. right? Um, and uh, he's, our, he's our newest colleague, and, and he's talking about how he was aware of, uh, you know, he would watch his shows, you know, Martin and, and Living Single and mm-hmm. Cosby and, and, and the other so-called black shows. Yeah. And his white friends would watch Dawson's Creek and this show mm-hmm. and that show. Mm-hmm. But he said he watched Dawson's Creek also, mm-hmm. right? I had a similar conversation several years ago where someone, we were talking about the acquisition of knowledge and, and, and social knowledge. Mm-hmm. And he asked me if I had read the great books. Mm-hmm. And he starts naming off all of those books. And I said, you know, sort of like when you're trading baseball cards, needed, got it, needed, got it. Mm-hmm. And as he was naming off all of these books, I said, well, yeah, I've read parts of it. I've read all of them. I've read this one twice. I've read this one. I've read that one. Mm-hmm. And then I said, well, how about you? Mm-hmm. Have you read the autobiography of Malcolm X? Mm-hmm. Have you read Dr. King's Where Do We Go From Here, Chaos or Community? Mm-hmm. Have you read H. Brad Brown? Mm-hmm. Have you read Stokely Carmichael? Mm-hmm. Have you read Booker T. Washington? Have you read James Baldwin? Have you read right. Marcus Garvey? Have you read right. W.E.B. Du Bois? Mm-hmm. And he said, well, no, I haven't. And, you know, you get to that argument. Mm-hmm. Your people have no literature. Well, we still have this conversation as we're preparing students for higher education, of right? Course. It's like what should be in their uh, cultural knapsack and right. what do we want them to be able to talk about? And it's still very much shaped by a um, Western European literary canon, yeah. right? Um, and I, I think about that as a high school teacher, I thought about that often, right? Like when we talk about the great books. Right. Well, have you read? And, you know, and the funny thing about it was I unconsciously, as I started naming off all of the the books that he didn't consider great, mm-hmm. I kept naming men. Mm-hmm. Right. But I didn't mention Alice Walker. Mm-hmm. OK. I didn't mention, you know, that, that, but at the time I actually did. Yeah. I, I mentioned Toni Morrison. Mm-hmm. You know, I mentioned, OK, I said, you probably haven't even read. You haven't read. You certainly haven't read Phyllis Wheatley. Mm-hmm. You haven't read Zora Neale Hurston. Yeah. You haven't read Dorothy West. You mm-hmm. haven't read Jesse Fawcett. Mm-hmm. So all of these people, mm-hmm. you keep asking me if I've read all the great books. Mm-hmm. And every great book, or every book that you call great, mm-hmm. who's written by white people, mm-hmm. I've read. Mm-hmm. And then I ask you about all the great books that I thought make mm-hmm. you part of the, the, the black intelligentsia. Mm-hmm. You've never read those. Mm-hmm. So if I've read all of your books, so-called, Mm-hmm. But you've read none of mine. Does that not make me doubly smarter than you? <laughs> it certainly adds to my double consciousness. Sure. And the conversation had to end there mm-hmm. because, of course, the answer was yes. If I've read twice as much as you. That's right. How can you think that you're as mm-hmm. well read as me? Right. Right. And it's not about the acquisition of the, 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 the stacking up of these books. We're mm-hmm. not collecting these stories like they're stamps. Mm-hmm. We're reading them to enrich our experiences. Right, well, there, there's a, a epistemological uh, implications for how we think about acquiring knowledge, yes. right? Like, what, is it just stacking up our, our reading uh, list? Mm-hmm. Uh, what, how are we internalizing that, that knowledge and what are we doing with it to put it into action right. in the world? Right. And that's that other part of literacy, right? right? Is that it's not confined to in your head or even in your body or your heart. It's about putting it into action in the world Correct. to affect change. The praxis. The praxis. The praxis, the praxis of it. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's what Ray talked about. Yeah. Mm-hmm. When 
not stacking up books to prove that we can read. We're stacking up books so that we can stand on them and help us see further. Nice. Right? Nice. To, to sort of paraphrase uh, the, yeah. the, if I can see further, it's because I've stood on the shoulders of giants. Mm -hmm. If I can see further, it's because I've stood on, this, on two stacks of books, mm. perhaps three stacks of books yeah. that help me see further. Nicely said. And so just as we wrap up here, I'm so thrilled we were able to come in and have this conversation. Um, and I think teachers and others listening will get so much out of thinking about these ideas in a, in a modern context. Um, what, what would be your final message, uh, if you will, to maybe educators, maybe people thinking about going into teaching, anyone invested in the lives of young people, what would you want them to take from W.B. Du Bois' life and scholarship and writing and internalize and apply today to their work? W.E.B. Du Bois came into the educational landscape at a time when it was very nearly a capital offense mm. to be black and literate. Mm. And he used that literacy to help him to develop an aspirational sense. Hope and aspiration is the most important thing we get out of education. Mm -hmm. And he did it at a time when hoping was a mortal offense, mm -hmm. where it was something that was so frowned upon that, that it was very nearly a death penalty mm. for despised people. Mm -hmm. So if we're going to learn how to read and if we're going to learn how to ingest this work, mm -hmm. we should be doing it with the question, what is this going to do to help me to see my dream more clearly? Wow. And he was the first person that started doing that. You know, he wasn't just a guy who hung out with William James, who was a father of pragmatism. Mm -hmm. He was taught by William James as William James was developing pragmatism. Mm. So to me, that makes him a founding father of it. Mm. What types of problems can we see? Mm -hmm. What type of problems can we address once we see them? And we see these dreams mm -hmm. from being able to acquire whatever forms of knowledge we can, as much of it as we can. And that ought to be our lesson as we think about how we deal with Du Bois and how we hope that Du Bois will deal with us. Hmm. Beautifully said. Thank you so much for that. And if, if everyone could just join me again in welcome or, or thanking uh, Dr. Westbrook for coming. We really appreciate his passion and wisdom on W.B. Du Bois and what it means today for us who are working in the world of education. So thank you again for coming. We really appreciate you. Thank you. It's uh, my pleasure. And so we will catch you on the flip side for another episode of FDU EdCast. And that concludes this episode of FDU EdCast. We hope you enjoyed it. If you liked this episode, please leave a review on Apple Podcasts and subscribe. We might even select your review to read during our next episode and give away a free book from one of our guests. Tune in to find out and keep an eye out for upcoming episodes on our social media, the web, and anywhere you listen to podcasts. You can follow the FDU School of Education on Instagram at FDU underscore SOE. FDU EdCast is recorded on site at Fairleigh Dickinson University and globally on the web. The show is executive produced by Alan Debrin, Director of Instructional Technology Development, with support from faculty, staff, and students at the FDU School of Ed.